world. After thousands of years, during which humans were the rulers of the, of the world, authority and power will shift away from humans to computers, and most humans will become economically useless and politically powerless. Already today, we are beginning to see the creation of a new class of humans, the useless class. Just as they- Welcome, Welcome to, to the Crypto, crypto teacher. teacher. And guys, you know, I come back with that video just to make you think. We have Jerome in the house, delivering us a 75 basis point hike. And guys, we know they're gonna bring down the house, but not right now. I think they did the 75 basis points because we're gonna be running into midterms. Next month, I only see a 25 basis point hike. I know he said 50 to 75, but I definitely see a 25 basis point hike next month just because of midterms. We know they want to play the Hegelian dialectic going into midterms, guys. The next inflation data should show us decreasing. Also, we know that they control the supply and demand when it comes to oil. They can bring down oil tomorrow. But Jerome talked about the reset. The old world versus the new world. Mortgage rates have skyrocketed. And we know by raising rates, is going to cause a ripple effect in this economy. Layoffs are going to start beginning because there's no more free money for these corporations. Stocks and crypto sold off. And the question should be who sold? We know it was BlackRock and Vanguard. They own everything. And they're going to take that money to build a fourth industrial revolution. But Jerome Powell was asked, was he trying to induce a recession? Yes, he is. They want all these layoffs. They need people out of work. Remember, they cause a problem, wait for the action, run in with the solution. The fourth industrial revolution brings in the robots, algorithms, and drones while the sheep go inside the metaverse. Remember what the World Economic Forum stated. You will own nothing, but you will be happy. And remember the crypto teacher told you because he knows when it comes to the new world order, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. It appeared that the U.S. economy is, is in a strong position and well positioned to, to deal with uh, higher interest rates. We're, we're very low. Um, a good place to start is that rates were very, very low for quite a while because of the pandemic and the, and, you know, the need to do everything we could to support the economy when unemployment was 14 percent and the true unemployment rate was was well higher than that. So, and that you know that was a uh, rates are low, and now now they're coming back up to more normal or above levels. So, um, in the meantime, while rates were low and while demand was really high, obviously demand for housing changed from wanting to live in urban areas to some extent to living in in single family homes in the suburbs, famously. And so the demand was just suddenly much higher, and uh, low. So we saw prices moving up very, very uh, strongly for the last couple of years. So that changes now, and rates have moved up. We're well aware that rate, mortgage rates have moved up a lot, and you're, you're, you know, you're seeing a changing housing market. We're watching it to see what will happen. How much will it really affect residential investment? Not really sure. Uh, what will, how much will it affect housing prices? You know, not really sure. It's, uh, I mean, obviously we're watching that quite carefully. You would think over time, I mean, so there's a, there's a tremendous amount of supply in the housing market of unfinished homes. And as those come online, it, whereas the, the, the supply of finished homes, inventory of finished homes that are for sale is incredibly low, historically low. So that it's still a very tight market. So prices may keep going up for a while, even in a world where rates are, are up. So it's a complicated situation. We watch it very carefully. Um, you know, I, I would say if you're, if you're a home buyer, somebody or a young person looking to buy a home, you, you need a bit of a reset. You, we, we need to get back to a place where, where supply and demand are, are back uh, together and where inflation is down low again and mortgages are, mortgage rates are low again. So this, this will be a process whereby we ideally we, we, we do our work in a way that where the housing market settles in a new place and 
housing availability and, and, and credit availability are at appropriate levels. It's a question of very strong demand, but you, you, could, you couldn't get this kind of inflation without a change on the supply side, which is there for anybody to see, which is these, these blockages and shortages and people dropping out of the labor force and, and things like that. So that's, that's how we're looking at it. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of work internally on uh, – and thinking about, about what all that means. You don't – the thing is you don't know whether those forces are – to the, what extent are they going to be sustained. In other words, will we go back to a world where it looks a little more like the old world or are we going really going to be in a world where major supply shocks go on and on? The history is you, you see these waves of supply shocks as you did in, in the 70s. And then they go away, and and you know, sort of there, there's a new normal, and things settle down. But honestly, we don't know uh, what what that's going to be. In the meantime, we have to find price stability in this new world, and maximum employment in this new world, where clearly inflationary forces are. You, you're seeing them everywhere. Again, if you look look around the world at where inflation levels are, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's not just here. In fact, we're sort of in the middle of the pack. Although I think we have a, we have, of course, a different kind of inflation that other people have, and uh, uh, partly because our economy is stronger and, and more highly recovered. So that, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we've done a lot of introspection and work on that. And um, sorry, on, on QT, um, you know, we've communicated really clearly to the markets about what, what we're going to do there. Markets seem to be okay with it. Um, we're, we're, we're phasing in. Um, Treasury issuance is down quite a lot, quite a lot from where it's been. So I have no reason to think markets are forward-looking and they see this coming. I have no reason to think it, it uh, will lead to illiquidity and problems. It seems to be kind of understood and accepted at this point. Um, of course, we've been looking, you know, very carefully and hard at why inflation picked up so much more than expected last year and why it proved so persistent. We, uh, it's hard to overstate the extent of uh, interest we have in that question, morning, noon, and night. So, um, but you have to put, you have to understand the context for, really the context is this, for, you know, decades before the, the pandemic and the reopening, you had a world where inflation was dominated by <clears throat> disinflationary forces such as declining population or, or aging demographics, let's call it that. Financial conditions have tightened. Um, over the last seven months, and that's a good thing, we think. But the federal funds rate, even after this increase, is at 1.6%. So it's hard to see how that, that is too high of a rate. And if, even if we did another, you know, we're, so we're going to get here by the end of the summer somewhere in the twos probably. Still, that's, a, that's still a low rate. So that's not a rate that is calculated to bring a recession on. And we'll, by then we'll have seen a whole lot more data. Um, as I mentioned a couple times, the committee's views are around a, a, a modestly restrictive stance, which would be in the three to three and a half percent range by the end of this year. But that's that's you know conditioned on that being the appropriate thing to do. If we see data going in a different direction, it'll be reflected in our in our policy, as you see today. You know, we'll be watching if <clears throat> uh, if, if things go in a direction we don't expect, and we're going to adapt. And, and I would say this is a highly uncertain environment, extraordinarily uncertain environment. So, um, again, we'll be, we'll be determined and resolved, but flexible. And then also whether um, this means the FOMC is trying to induce a recession now to bring inflation down. Not trying to reduce, induce a recession now. Let's be clear about that. We're trying to achieve... Uh, 2% inflation consistent with the strong labor market. That's, that's what we're trying to do. So let me talk about that sentence. Um, clearly, it's our goal to bring about 2% inflation while keeping the labor market strong, right? And, and that's, that's kind of what the SEP says, that the SEP has inflation getting down to two, two, a little above 2% in 2024 with, with unemployment at 4.1%. So and this is a strong labor market. This is a good labor market. Um, and as I mentioned, there are pathways to do it. But those pathways have become much more challenging due to factors that are not under our control. Again, thinking here of the fallout from the war in the Ukraine, which has brought a spike in you know, prices of energy, food, fertilizer, industrial chemicals, 
and also just the supply chains more broadly, which have been larger than or longer lasting than anticipated. So the sentence that we deleted said that we believe that appropriate monetary policy effectively alone can bring about the result of 2% inflation with a strong labor market. And so much of it is really not down to monetary policy. It just didn't, it just, the, the, the sentence isn't, it, it, it kind of says on its face that monetary policy alone can do this. And that's, that's not, that just didn't seem appropriate, so we took the sentence out. You know, we're not, again, we're not, we don't seek to put people out of work, of course. We, we never think too many people are working and fewer people need to have jobs. But we also think that you, you really cannot have the kind of labor market we want without price stability. And we have to, we have to go back and establish price stability so we can have that kind of labor market. And that's a labor market where, um, you know, where workers are getting wage increases. Maybe, maybe the workers at the lower end of the spectrum are getting the biggest wage increases as they were before the pandemic, um, where participation is high, where there's lots of job opportunities, where it's just a really, I mean, the, the labor market we had before the pandemic was, that's what we want to get back to. And you see, you see, you know, disparities between various groups at historic lows. We'd love to get back to that place. But to get there, it's, it's not going to happen with, you know, with the levels of inflation we have. So we have to, we have to restore that. And um, it, it really is in service in the medium and longer term of the kind of labor market we want and hope to achieve. So you're right. In, in, the, in the SEP, we have unemployment going up to 4. Point, the median is 4.1%. Is, uh, is there are, of course, a range of, of, uh, of actual forecasts. And I, I would characterize that if you if you were to get inflation down to, you know, on its way down to two percent, and the unemployment went up to rate went up to four point one percent, that's still a you know historically low level. You know, we hadn't seen we hadn't seen rates unemployment rates below four percent until a couple of years ago. For we'd seen it for like one year in the last fifty. So the idea that you know three point three point six percent is historically low in, in the last century. So a four point one percent unemployment rate with with inflation well on its way to two percent, I think that would be I, I would I think that would be a successful outcome. So we're not looking to to have a higher unemployment rate, but I would say that we I would certainly look at that as a successful outcome. And right right now our policy rate is well below neutral, right? So the, 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 Soon enough, we'll, we'll have our policy rate, let's assume the world works about, out about like the SEP says, the policy rate will be up where we think it should be. And then the question would be, do you slow down? Does it make you, you know, you'll be making these judgments about, is it appropriate now to slow down from 50 to 25, let's say, or speed up? You know, that, so that's the kind of thinking we'll, we'll be doing. And we'll be, again, we're looking, ultimately, we're not going to declare victory until we see uh, a series of these, you know, really see convincing evidence, compelling evidence that inflation is coming down. And th that's what I mean by, that's what it would take for us to say, okay, we think, uh, we think this is, this job is done. Um, because we saw, and frankly, we saw last year, inflation came down over the course of the summer and then turned right around and went back up. So I think we're going to be careful about, uh, about declaring victory. But our, again, the implementation of our policy is going to be going to be flexible and sensitive to incoming data. Are you more concerned now that uh, to bring down inflation, it's going to require more than just some pain at this point? Again, I, th I think that um, I do think that uh, their objective, and this is what's reflected in the SEP, but our objective really is to bring inflation down to 2% while the labor market remains strong. I think that um, what's becoming more clear is that, that many factors that we don't control are going to play a very significant role in, in deciding whether that's possible or not. And there I'm thinking, of course, of commodity prices, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, supply chain, things like that, where we really can't, we really can't Monetary policy stand, you know, stance doesn't affect those things. So, but having said that, there, there is a you know there is a path that the there is a path for us to get there. Um, it's not getting easier. Uh, it's it's getting more challenging because of these external forces. And that that path is to 
to move demand down, and you have a lot of surplus demand. In uh, take for example in the uh, in the labor market, uh, so it, you have two va job vacancies essentially for every person seek actively seeking a job, and that has led to a real imbalance in wage negotiating. You you could get to a place where where that ratio was was a more at a more normal level, and you wouldn't ex you would expect to see those wage pressures move back down to level where people are still getting healthy wage increases, real wage increases, but at a level that's consistent with 2% inflation. So that's that's a possibility, and you could say the same thing about some of the product markets where there's just excess capacity, and you know where the really where the, the strong demand has gone into sorry where there's where there's their capacity constrained, right? So you have effectively what we think of as a vertical supply curve or close to it. So demand comes in and it's very strong and it, it shows up in higher prices, not not higher quantities, not more cars because they can't make the cars because they don't have the semiconductors. So in principle, that could work in reverse. When demand comes down, you could see, and it's not guaranteed, but you could see prices coming down more than the typical economic relationships that you see in the textbooks would suggest because of the unusual situation we're in on the supply side. So there's a pathway there. It is it is not going to be easy, uh, and you know the, they're, they're, again, it's our objective, but um, uh, as I mentioned, it's going to depend to some extent on factors we can control. How high does the rate really need to go? And this is you know the estimates on the committee are, are in that range of three and a half to four percent. And how do you think about that? Well, you can think about the the longer run neutral rate. You can compare it to that, and we think that's in the mid twos. Um, you can look, frankly, at broader financial conditions. You can look at, you know, asset prices. You can look at the effect you're having on the economy, rates, asset prices, credit spreads. All of those things go into that. You can you can also look at the yield curve and ask all along the yield curve where is what where is the policy rate? So for much of the yield curve now, real rates are positive. That's not true at the short end. At, at the short end of the yield curve in, in the early years. You don't have real neg you have negative rates still, so that, I, that but to, that really is one data point. It's one part of financial conditions. So I th I think you, you I, I have to look at it this way: we move the policy rate that affects financial conditions and that affects the economy. You know we have of course ways rigorous ways to think about it, but ultimately it comes down to: do we think financial conditions are in a place where they're having the desired effect on the economy? And that desired effect is. We'd like to see, you know, demand moderating. Demand is very hot still in the economy. We'd like to see the labor market getting ba better in balance between supply and demand, and that can happen both from supply and demand. Right now, there's demand is substantially higher than than available supply, though. So we feel that there's a role for us in moderating demand. Those are the things we can affect with our with our policy tools. There are many things we can't affect, uh, and and those would be. You know things, uh, the, the commodity price issues that we're having around the world due to the war in uh, Ukraine and um, and the fallout from that, and also just the, all of the supply side things that are still, you know, pushing upward on inflation. So that's that's really how how I think I would think about it. being to see clear signs of at least inflation flattening out and ideally beginning to decline. We've said that we'd be data dependent, focused on incoming data, highly attentive to inflation risks, the things that I mentioned. Um, uh, to Howard moments ago. So contrary to expectations, inflation again surprised to the upside. Indicators, Some indicators of inflation expectations have risen uh, and projections of this year have moved up notably. So we thought that strong action was warranted at this meeting and today we delivered that in the form of a 75 basis point rate hike as I mentioned. So what was the, the point of it really is this. Um, we've been moving rates up uh, expeditiously to more normal levels and over the course of the seven months since we since we pivoted and began moving in this direction, we've seen uh, financial conditions tighten, and appropriately so. Um, but the federal funds rate, even after this move, is at 1.6 percent. So uh, again, the committee uh, is moving rates up expeditiously to more normal levels, and we came to the view that um, we'd like to do a little more front end loading on that. So I think that the, the SEP gives you the levels that people think are appropriate at, a, at given points in time. This was really about the speed with which you would get there. So as I mentioned, we, we 75 basis points today. I said the next meeting 
could could well be about a decision between 50 and 75. That would put us at the end of the July meeting, you know, in in that range of in that more normal range, and that's a desirable place to be because you begin to have more optionality there about the speed with which you would proceed going forward. Just t just talking about the SCP for a second. What, what it really says is that committee participants widely would like to see policy at a modestly restricted restrictive level at the end of this year, and that's six months from now. And you know, so much data and so much can happen. So remember how highly uncertain this is. But so that is generally a range of three to three and a half percent. That's where people are, and that's that's what they want to see. Knowing what they know now and understanding that we need to be. We need to show resolve, but also be flexible to incoming data as we see it. If things are better, we don't need to do that much. So, and if they're not, then we, you know, either do that much or possibly even more. Uh, but in any case, it will be very data dependent. Then you're looking at next year, and what you're seeing is people see more, a bit more tightening, and in, in, in a range of maybe three and a half to four percent. And that's generally what people see as the appropriate path for getting inflation under control and starting back down and then getting back down to 2%. So 75 basis points seem like the right, the right thing to do at this meeting, and, um, and uh, that's what we did. Uh, Chair Powell, do you feel you uh, box yourself in with the language you used at the last press conference on uh, 50 basis point hikes in June and July? And would you please give us uh, as detailed a sense you can of what role you played uh, in reshaping market expectations so quickly on Monday? So, um, as you know, we we uh, always aim to provide as much clarity as we can about our policy intentions, subject to the in inherent uncertainty in the economic outlook, because we think monetary policy is more effective when market participants understand how policy will, will evolve, when they understand our, our objective function, our reaction function. Um, and in the current highly unusual circumstances with inflation well above our goal, we think it's helpful, helpful to provide, provide even more clarity than usual, um, again, subject to uncertainty in the outlook. So, um, and I think over the course of, over the course of this year, financial uh, markets have responded uh, and, and have generally shown that they understand the path we're, we're, uh, we're laying out. It, of course, it remains data dependent. Um, and so that's what we generally think about guidance, and that's why we offer it. And of course, when we offered that, when I offered that guidance uh, at the last meeting, I did say that it was subject to the economy performing about in line with expectations. I also said that uh, if the economy performed, if data came in worse than expected, then we would consider moving even more aggressively. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down and we're moving expeditiously to do so. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. The economy and the country have been through a lot over the past two and a half years and have proved resilient. It is essential that we bring inflation down if we are to have a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. From the standpoint of our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability, the current picture is plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight and inflation is much too high. Against this backdrop, today the Federal Open Market Committee raised its policy interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point and anticipates that ongoing increases in that rate will be appropriate. In addition, we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. I'll have more to say about today's monetary policy actions after briefly reviewing economic developments. Overall economic activity edged down <clears throat> in the first quarter as unusually sharp swings in inventories and net exports more than offset continued strong underlying demand. Recent indicators suggest that real GDP growth has picked up this quarter with consumption spending remaining strong. In contrast, <clears throat> growth in <clears throat> business fixed in investment appears to be slowing, and activity in the housing sector looks to be softening, in part reflecting higher mortgage rates. The tightening in financial conditions that we've seen in recent months should continue to temper growth and help bring demand into better balance with supply. As shown in our summary of economic projections, FOMC participants have marked down their projections for economic activity 
with the median projection for real GDP growth running below 2% through 2024. The labor market has remained <clears throat> extremely tight with the unemployment rate near a 50-year low, job vacancies at historical highs, and wage growth elevated. Over the past three months, employment rose by an average of 408,000 jobs per month, down from the average pace seen earlier in the year, but still robust. Improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. Labor demand is very strong, while labor supply remains subdued, with the labor force participation rate little changed since January. FOMC participants expect supply and demand conditions in the labor market to come into better balance, easing the upward pressures on wages and prices. The median projection in the SEP for the unemployment rate rises somewhat over the next few years, moving from 3.7% at the end of this year to 4.1% in 2024, levels that are noticeably above the March projections. Inflation remains <clears throat> well above our longer run goal of 2%. Over the 12 months ending in April, total PCE prices rose 6.3%, excluding the volatile food and energy categories. Core prices rose 4.9%. In May, the 12-month change in the Consumer Price Index came in above expectations at 8.6%, and the change in the core CPI was 6%. Aggregate demand is strong, supply constraints have been larger and long-lasting than anticipated, and price pressures have spread to a broad range of goods and services. The surge in prices of crude oil and other commodities that resulted from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is boosting prices for gasoline and food, and is creating additional upward pressure on inflation. And COVID-related COVID lockdowns in China are likely to exacerbate supply chain disruptions. FOMC participants have revised up their projections for inflation this year, particularly for total PCE inflation, given developments in food and energy prices. The median projection is 5.2% this year and falls to 2.6% next year and 2.2% in 2024. Participants continue to see risks to inflation as weighted to the upside. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and price and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks high inflation poses to both, so both sides of our mandate, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. Against the backdrop of the rapidly evolving economic environment, our policy has been adapting, and it will continue to do so. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by three quarters of a percentage point, resulting in a one and a half percentage point increase in the target range so far this year. The committee reiterated that it anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. And we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet, which plays an important role in firming the stance of monetary policy. Coming out of our last meeting in May, there was a broad sense on the committee that a half percentage point increase in the target range should be considered at this meeting if economic and financial conditions evolved in line with expectations. We also stated that we were highly attentive to inflation risks and that we would be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. Since then, inflation has again surprised to the upside. Some indicators of inflation expectations have risen, and projections for inflation this year have been rise, revised up notably. In response to these developments, the committee decided that a larger increase in the target range was warranted at today's meeting. <clears throat> this continues our approach of expeditiously moving our policy rate up to more normal levels, and it will help ensure that longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2%. As shown in the SEP, <clears throat> the median projection for the appropriate level of the federal funds rate is 3.4% at the end of this year, a percentage point and a half higher than projected in March, and 0.9 percentage point above the median estimate of its longer run value. The median projection rises further to 3.8% at the end of next year, 
and declines to 3.4% in 2024, still above the median longer run value. Of course, these projections do not represent a committee plan or decision, and no one knows with any certainty where the economy will be a year or more from now. Over coming months, <clears throat> we will be looking for compelling evidence that inflation is moving down, consistent with inflation returning to 2%. We anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. The pace of those changes will continue to depend on the incoming data and the evolving outlook for the economy. Clearly, today's 75 basis point increase is an unusually large one, and I do not expect moves of this size to be common. From the perspective of today, either a 50 basis point or a 75 basis point increase seems most likely at our next meeting. We will, however, make our decisions meeting by meeting and will continue to, to communicate our thinking as clearly as we can. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keep longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Making appropriate monetary policy in this uncertain environment requires a recognition that the economy often evolves in unexpected ways. Inflation has obviously uh, surprised to the upside over the past year, and further surprises could be in store. We therefore will need to be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. And we will strive to avoid adding uncertainty to what is already an extraordinarily challenging and uncertain time. We are highly attentive to inflation risk risks and determined to take the measures necessary to restore price stability. The American economy is very strong and well positioned to handle tighter monetary policy. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your we're going to a different economy, and we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly, we're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're, going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. This effort. And China has big plans for this. They intend to seed um, their digital yuan into the global environment by giving it away to visitors at next winter's Olympics. When they arrive at the airport, they're going to get di yuan digital wallets. They're going to receive digital yuan. They're going to use it uh, throughout their visits to Beijing, and then they're going to take it back to their own countries. They see this as a huge advantage. Why? Because who controls the underlying protocols? Who un controls the underlying standards? of the future of money will control the future of money. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come, Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids books. You know, I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis, whether it's your job, whether it's in your community. We have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share. But this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends, 
So therefore, we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Joshua and Grandma Tim. Save the village. Part 2. King Joshua and Grandma Tim. Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Joshua and Grandma Tim. Goes to China. It's mandatory to get part one, part two, and part three of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.